St. Francis, Francis Xavier Church in Kansas City. St. Ignatius Church. SI Prep in Illinois. SI in San Francisco. St. Ignatius Parish Chestnut Hill. St. Ignatius Parish San Francisco. St. John's High School. St. Joe's Prep. St. Louis University High School. St. Mary's Student Parish. St. Paul's Catholic Center at Boise State University. St. <laughs> Xavier High School. Strake Jesuit College Prep. Stewart Hall High School. UNCW Catholic Newman Center. University of Detroit Mercy. University of Notre Dame. University of San Francisco. Woo! Where am I? University of Scranton. Villa? Via. Via. Via Maria Academy High School. <laughs> Wall Street. Wheeling. Xavier College Prep in California. Xavier High School in New York. And Xavier University. All right. All right, good afternoon. Let me try that again. Good afternoon. One more time. Good afternoon. All right, thank you. Let me have your attention, please. Thank you so much. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed those breakout sessions. Earlier today, we heard from some of our sponsors. We have a few more that are going to share some stories. We're going to begin with our friends from Contemplative, uh, Contemplative Rebellion. They have a brief video, and then we're going to invite up Denise Travers to share a few words. So let's begin that video. I got the rights to use that. Uh, and actually, I do make jewelry, but I also work in IT as a system administrator, and I love working in IT. I also have two, get, two kids and uh, an awesome husband. Um, I'm a testament to how many millions of ways there are to do social justice in the world. I created Contemplative Rebellion one year ago with an entrepreneur's spirit and the heart of a social justice warrior. 90% of the jewelry that we have is made by refugees in Charlotte, North Carolina. They've settled there over the last 10 years, recently and also before. And also 20 to 100% of the profit from our jewelry goes to support specific organizations who are already doing an excellent job. And uh, each of our pieces represents a specific issue for social justice. Okay. 
I was determined to keep my full-time job, stay married, attempt great parenting, and also have a personal relationship with local refugees um, to ground me. We'd love to have your support. Your IFTJ 20% 20, 20 off discount code works on our website and at our table um, until midnight tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Denise. And now let's invite up Daniel Cardoza from Ethics Merch. Thanks for having me, guys. So what we buy matters. It matters to us because it helps us enjoy life, shapes who we are. But what we buy also matters to someone else. It matters to workers, the people who we usually never see and never meet but who literally make our stuff possible. Take clothing, for example. What we wear matters to us, but it also matters to garment workers. Did you know that the legal minimum wage in most garment-producing countries is not sufficient to feed a family, much less pay for education and healthcare? And in many cases, even the minimum wage is being ignored, not to mention basic workplace safety. So because what we buy matters to workers, what can we do to support them? Well, Ethics Merch is partnering directly with workers in North Carolina to create a new line of apparel that guarantees workers living wages and safe conditions and avoids the subcontracting race to the bottom that lets brands like Gildan, Nike, and Under Armour ignore sweatshop abuses in their factories year after year. The clothes will be made mainly by Guatemalan immigrants who came to rural North Carolina with sewing skills and a desire for a better life for their families. The project will launch in 2019 with a pilot program at a few Catholic schools, including Bellarmine Prep in San Jose. Thank you. This is through the Catholic Relief Services Global High Schools program. The program will include the opportunity for students to tour the textile mills in North Carolina, meet the workers in person, and for those interested in fashion to help design the apparel that we offer to schools for your spirit stores, uniforms, events, service trips, and student groups. I'm here because we need your help. Sign up here, follow along with the brand's progress, learn how to bring ethically sourced apparel to your campus, and choose a faith that does justice. Thank you so much for your time. All right, and now we're gonna enjoy a video from our friends at Sojourners. And now I'd like to uh, welcome up Sonia and Alicia from the University of San Francisco. Okay, so I'm gonna take over the mic a quick second and give a shout out to Bellman College Prep in San Jose. <laughs> All right. My name is Alicia Tapia. And I'm Sonia Ariola. And we are doctoral students at the McGrath Institute for Jesuit Catholic Education at the University of San Francisco. <laughs> We're here to invite all of you to the beautiful sanctuary city of San Francisco. So now when people think of San Francisco, often the image of the Golden Gate Bridge comes to mind, and so we'd like to build upon this image. When you think of the Golden Gate Bridge, painted in international orange, I'd like you to also picture the international community of USF. We are a melting pot of individuals from all continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. When you think of the Golden Gate Bridge, think of an open gate. We are a university dedicated to equity and inclusion where everyone is welcome, especially you, our Jesuit brothers and sisters. When you think of the Golden Gate Bridge, think of the city leading change. 
Think of where you will be challenged and encouraged and supported to pursue the critical questions that aim to dismantle the unjust structures in our society. So, if you're coming to San Francisco, be sure to remember that you have family there. Visit us at the University of San Francisco. Thank you. All right, another shout out to USF. Woo. Um, so we have our last set of Ignatian speakers uh, that we're about to hear from. They are from Spring Hill College. Their names are Sydney Clark, Ariel Evans, Alyssa Miles, and Cameron Powell. And their talk is titled our experience at the Equal Justice Initiative. The Equal Justice Initiative opened a new museum and memorial in Montgomery last spring. The Equal Justice Initiative is a nonprofit organization that provides legal representation to people who have been illegally convicted, unfairly sentenced, or abused in state jails and prisons. It also works with communities that have been marginalized by poverty and discouraged by unequal treatment. A group of Spring Hill College students went to EJI's Peace and Justice Summit to experience the weekend and to see the museum and memorial. The Legacy Museum opens the doors for conversation about the history of slavery in the United States and the lasting effect it has had and continues to have on society. The words, you are standing on a site where enslaved people were warehoused, are the first words we saw when we walked into the museum. It was chilling. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice is the place to commemorate those who lost their lives from being lynched. Names of individuals hung on blocks of iron that depicted their counties. The number of names on each block, the number of iron blocks themselves, and the story each name held was shocking. But it was partnered with reverent beauty. Everywhere I looked, there were people sharing their stories. They intentionally were looking at each other and were starting a conversation with someone who was willing to listen. Our time in Montgomery allowed us the freedom to hurt and begin to heal. We created the space to make room for the beauty of God. We took time to listen, to begin the journey and move forward towards peace and justice. Our mission this weekend is to journey to the intersections as disciples and allies, to be listeners and advocates. As we continue with our presentation, you'll see pictures from our experience at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Each of us took something different from our time in Montgomery, and you can see that through these pictures. The museum and also shed light on the U.S. prison system and displayed how mass incarceration equates to modern-day slavery. In 2018, blacks remain in chains behind bars, making up 37.9% of the prison population. They are labeled as criminal for the rest of their lives. They enter into a permanent second-class status and are stripped of basic civil and human rights. During our time in Montgomery, we learned about Anthony Ray Hinton, who was on death row in Alabama for 30 years before being released for a crime he did not commit. Hinton adamantly reached out to EJI's Brian Stevenson and his legal team for aid. Due to EGI's commitment to its mission, Anthony Hinton now has a voice to share his story with the masses. As we meet at these intersections, we recall words of advice from Pope Francis. This is important, to get to know people, listen, expand the circle of ideas. The world is crisscrossed by roads that come together and move apart, but the important thing is that they lead toward the good. May we journey together toward that good. My trip 
to Montgomery became more personal than I ever could have imagined. <clears throat> it was a sunny day in Montgomery, Alabama. The energy of the group was high yet reverent. As we ventured in, we looked up and saw places that we recognized in years that meant things to us. I, however, ended up lagging behind the group because I saw names that I did not expect. Their names were Samuel and William Powell. They were lynched on July 24th, 1917 in Lowndes County, Alabama. I saw these names and this trip full of reverence and memorialization became this much larger quest for self-discovery and familial reconciliation. Samuel and William were the only kin that I found that I recognized. I found Charles Powell, who was lynched in Lafayette County, Arkansas. Robert Powell, who was lynched in Harris County, Texas. Jim Powell, who was lynched on June 4th in 1895, and at least five others whose names struck my heart. There were tears, a lot of tears and a connection to my past that I thought died with the beat of their hearts, yet here I am. Here we are, talking about them, looking at their lives and the impact that the death of my family members and the death of so many others has on us in this present moment. This trip to EJI was a reminder of the reality that we are, that I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. For who in their right mind in 1895 would think that a black man who was a son of a slave and a sharecrapper himself would have kin from Chicago who decades later would be standing on a stage talking about him? <laughs> talking about him and his sacrifice and that I would be someone who can read, who can write, who can, has, and will vote. <laughs> and be someone who can truly experience life. At EJI, legendary journalist Gloria Steinhem said that hope is a form of planning. And seeing my family members' names etched into history has given me hope because of how far we have come. Yet it has set my heart on fire to make plans because of how far yet we still have to go. Hope. I have hope that we are now standing on the right side of history. The opening of the museum and memorial is just one of the building blocks towards social change. Fear is something that often holds us, holds us back from having many of these important conversations. Whether that is fear of the unknown, fear of not being heard, or fear of being misunderstood. We must begin to have these uncomfortable conversations. I am hopeful for our future because we are starting to address many issues African Americans have faced for so long. Mass incarceration, police brutality, and inequality are just some of the many issues that are coming to surface. For myself, hope is found in sharing my experiences with the world. Hope is found in taking the steps to better the lives of others. So register to vote and actually vote. Too many people have fought and died for this right. Talk to elected officials and express your concern about policies. On Monday, you will be given this opportunity to discuss these very issues. This is a battle that is not fought by one, but by many joining together to fight for the injustices of the world. And always remember, 
We are our future. So now we will do a different kind of song. It's called Silence. <laughs> We've heard a lot of very powerful things. And this is also a way to sing by listening to the song of our heart. So let's take 30 seconds of silence. Seat yourselves up. What comes up for you? What have I heard? ¿Qué es lo que he escuchado y cómo me impacta? What have I heard and how does it affect me? 30 seconds. And let's take a deep breath. Who's going to be here? Raise your hand. Who's going to be here tomorrow for the rally before we go lobby? All right. So we uh, have our cultural work as your artist in residence here at IFTJ. We always have a workshop in which we plan tomorrow's vigil. So here are two of our actions that will include, that will be part of the vigil. And, um, and then after the mass, if we could join us to prepare, to help us prepare the piece. Uh, first, we have the visual part of the, of the, re, of the rally that, that Vince and Katie will tell us about. Hey family, my name is Nick and I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so happy. Oh. That must be Wheeling Jesuit University over there. God bless y'all. Um, so, I'm from Appalachia, and we have a strong history of telling stories. And so we're going to invite you all to tell your stories with us tomorrow. So after Mass, we want you to come and find us, and we're going to be writing, you all are going to be writing your prayers for immigration, for criminal justice reform, for um, restorative justice. And we're going to carry these prayers with us at the rally tomorrow and then present them to the intercession of the Holy Family, who I'm sure you've seen us wandering around the halls with, St. Joseph, the Blessed Mother, and baby Jesus. So we look forward to you all bringing your prayers and to sharing those with us. Thank you. Thanks. And Yvonne, as an equality, and uh, Vincent are going to tell us our movement part. And all this, for those who really want to encourage you after Mass to join us. Just one of them. Okay. There's several movements. Hi, yes, my name is Yvonne, and I'm from Villanova University. <laughs> and so we're going to teach you one of the three movements that we have for the rally. 
So we're going to teach you our movement for immigration. So if you want to stand up. So for immigration, what inspired us um, with this movement is we want to be open, um, have open arms for our brothers and sisters, our human family. So what we're going to do is we're going to, with our right arm, swoop in, welcoming from the right, welcoming from the left, welcoming everyone. One more time. Welcoming from the right, welcoming from the left, welcoming everyone. And then fist, you know? Yeah, just strength. So that is the first of three movements. And then we will also have a song, but when uh, Peace Poets come in, we'll share with you the, the, so the theme song that came out of the workshop. All right, everyone, please be seated, and we're on for our next piece. Deep breath, everybody. Deep breath. Take in all this wonderful energy of grace in which we are surrounded. Gracias. As a Jesuit-inspired community, we are called to be contemplatives and action. This conference, the speakers, and the breakout sessions give us the space to see and judge. It gives us space to discern. Moved by our experiences, and by love, we now must act. Monday is about action. Action that this country desperately needs. One of this year's advocacy priorities is immigration reform. Tomorrow, over 1,500 of us will give a human face to policy. We will speak truth to power, and we will, change, we will challenge our lawmakers to work for more just laws. I'd like to introduce Joanna Williams. She is the Director of Education and Advocacy at the Kino Border Initiative. Joanna is a companion to the migrants that Kino accompanies. She is constantly elevating their voices and teaching others how to do the same. Joanna will now provide our immigration policy briefing. So I have the dubious honor of trying to animate you and inform you so that you can go out tomorrow to advocate with your senators and representatives. And I think the best starting place for us is the question that I always ask myself of why do I keep advocating for immigration reform year after year when, to be perfectly honest, oftentimes see things seem to get worse instead of better. And my answer to the question is, if you can go to the next slide, the, is because of women like Ruby. Uh, I met Ruby several times. Uh, in a moment, we'll see a photo when we switch slides. We'll see a photo of her kids. There we go. Uh, so on the left, you can see Ruby's three children. Uh, they all live in Atlanta, Georgia. Ruby stayed in our women's shelter on three different occasions, trying to cross the border and get back to her kids, because all that she wanted was her, for her kids to have a mom again. When I talked with her the fourth time that she was staying, the, the fourth time that she had been deported, and asked her what she was going to do next, and she said, I don't see an alternative. I'm going to cross the border because I believe that one day I will be again with my children. I have to advocate for immigration reform because if Ruby hasn't given up, then I certainly don't have the privilege or the right to give up on Ruby. <laughs> And so I'd encourage you all to go out with that same attitude of persistence. 
If you're in high school, it might be many years that you're visiting the Hill and trying to encourage our legislators to have a more humane and just approach for immigration. But that's okay because there will still be people like Ruby who are crossing the border and they still need you to advocate for them. I also advocate for immigration reform because I recognize that women like Ruby are right now facing customs and border protection in full riot gear, which is what they're uh, bringing out at the moment at our ports of entry. This is a, a photo of one of the customs and border protection officers uh, stationed right now at the ports. I'm embarrassed that the response of our country to women like Ruby and other people in need uh, is to treat this issue as a military issue. Uh, so I would encourage you to continue to be persistent and to recognize your responsibility tomorrow. You might have heard there's an election on Tuesday. <laughs> so we're going at a quite an interesting moment uh, where you have the opportunity for an, you're talking to an office that for the last several months has been thinking obsessively about Tuesday and your challenge tomorrow is to make them think beyond. Make them think about what's gonna happen on Wednesday after the election, no matter which direction the election goes. Uh, how are these offices going to choose to act on Wednesday? So there's a couple of different pieces of immigration that I'd like you to, to encourage you to focus on. Uh, the first is the very immediate. If we can go to the next slide, the appropriations, uh, the appropriation is a really big word for funding, basically. Essential principle of advocacy is that the government can't do anything if it doesn't have the money to do it. So your job tomorrow is to explain to your senators and representatives what your taxpayers' dollars should be spent on. Because between Wednesday and December 7th, the government has to pass a funding bill for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if the funding expires December 7th, so there will be some measure to continue the budget. And what we want to encourage our senators and representatives to do is to vote to reduce funding for immigration detention beds, reduce funding for border patrol and immigration and customs enforcement agents, and reduce funding for border security infrastructure, including the wall. In case that's a little bit too complicated, you can just remember no boots, no beds, no wall. Those are your three areas of focus when it comes to funding. And for those of you who want to get a little bit more technical, so the big, big picture is let's not fund an infrastructure or continue to increase funding to an infrastructure that's harming our families and communities. If you want to get a little bit more technical, one of the actions that Immigration and Customs Enforcement has done over the course of the last year is that we actually have been very successful in preventing some of those increases of funding. So Immigration and Customs Enforcement has been pulling from other pots of money to try to detain more people than they're funded to detain. They've been detaining 2, 000, on average 2,000 more people a day than they have the funding for. So you can also ex explain that to your legislatures, to your senators and representatives, and encourage them to put some restrictions on that funding so that Immigration and Customs Enforcement can't so easily supplement their budget uh, to put people like, for those of you who heard from Fredis yesterday, to have funding to put people like Fredis in detention. So reducing funding and restricting the mobility of those funds are two goals for appropriations. This is a very urgent topic because this is going to make a difference in how we approach immigration in 2019 if we can convince our senators and representatives to act before December 7th. There's another piece of it news that's been around. So other than appropriations, which you'll be pushing on tomorrow, you might have heard of the, well, the caravan. Uh, so there's several thousand people, probably between, somewhere between three and 4,000 people who have fled Central America, primarily Honduras, and are in southern Mexico right now. We actually like to call them the exodus. Uh, it's a little bit more biblical, a little more appropriate, especially from our, our Catholic perspective. And what I'd like to encourage you all to do tomorrow is think about how can we reframe the narrative of this exodus. This will be the topic that your offices are thinking about for the next month that they're talking about that they're seeing on the news. So encourage your Congress people, sorry, there's a typo. Uh, encourage your Congress, Congress people to speak publicly uh, about their approach to the exodus and to speak publicly in a humanizing way. 
uh, so that they can have better oversight over the way that the Trump administration is responding. We want to make sure that our senators and representatives are equipped to reinforce that we have a moral, we have a legal, we have an ethical, we have a theological obligation to protect people who are fleeing from violence. It's quite natural for our Congress people to feel a little overwhelmed, to say, well, it seems like a pretty group, big group of people. The way that we want to reframe that narrative is we want to emphasize the way that communities have been welcoming this exodus along the journey. It's been absolutely incredible in southern Mexico to see people give tortillas, beans, the, what little they have in order to support people in need as they're along the journey. I think that we can, with all of the resources we have in the country, do at least as well as southern Mexico. And so we want to give that picture to our senators and representatives, that there actually is a potential for our communities to rise up and uh, offer to support people as they arrive uh, and enter into these asylum processes. Uh, so that's the, the narrative we want, is to emphasize the way that communities have stepped up and welcomed and that the United States community will also step in, up and it will also welcome. It's not just a government issue, it's an issue of, the, of community and NGO support. And then the final way that we want to reframe the narrative of the caravan is to communicate how the border is a vibrant place of meeting. The border is a place where people are crossing back and forth all the time with, for, to go to work, to go to school, uh, to go shopping, to buy tortillas. Uh, and emphasize that that's the picture of the border that's consistent with our Catholic values. We see a border where we see church meeting and, and uh, extending and growing and flourishing. That's what we celebrate at the Kino Border Initiative. And I'd encourage you to mention that to your senators and representatives, that when you think of border, you're not thinking of a wall that divides, but of a port that uh, unites. So it, I encourage you to, think, to mention these different pieces in connection with the Exodus. Again, to prepare your congressperson to speak out publicly in support of, a, of humane treatment for those who are arriving at our borders. And then the final piece of immigration policy that we're going to focus on is really staying focused on this broader vision. Again, remember the persistence of Ruby. We desperately need legal protections for youth who have deferred action for, for childhood arrival status, for families from Central America with temporary protected status, we need legal protections for those who have already made their lives in the U.S., for those who have kids at our Jesuit schools. So I encourage your legislators to continue to think about comprehensive immigration reform or compassionate immigration reform that provides pathways to legal status for those individuals. We also need to respect the rights of people to have life in their own communities. Our goal is not for everybody to come to the United States because most of the people that I talk to don't want to be in the United States. <laughs> Our goal is for people to have safety and dignity, economic dignity as well as uh, safety from violence in their own communities and for us to be a part of that process uh, by cutting some of our harmful aid to Central America as well as supporting uh, Central Americans, uh, supporting economic development in Central America. Uh, and providing reasonable pathways for people to enter the United States legally. When we can really cast this broader vision of what it would look like to have a humane and just immigration system, it transforms our, our idea of what the role of enforcement is. When I think about what immigration and customs enforcement could be, I think about a deportation officer uh, who was, whose job was supposed to be to deport uh, this man from Honduras who was seeking asylum and instead who encouraged him to stick with the legal process, encouraged him to go through court, encouraged him not to give up his rights, and was a motivating force for that young man to stay in detention for several months until on Wednesday he won his asylum case within detention. So let's re-envision the role of these agencies, let's re-envision the role of our immigration system and we can actually have incredible, compassionate, people who respect dignity in immigration and customs enforcement or, or, or customs and border protection who are promoting rights and protecting people instead of dividing families and harming communities. And I am so excited to have you, all of you, be a part of casting that vision to your senators and your representatives. Thank you.
Thank you, Joanna, for that policy briefing. Now, you have heard them throughout the day, but I have the distinct honor and pleasure to formally introduce you to our next speakers, who I have a deep love for, the Peace Poets. At their core, the Peace Poets are a family. They are a family that makes music and poetry for the liberation of the human family. They are a mix of a rap crew and a humanitarian initiative, a blend of a rising artistic army of music makers who are making freedom songs contagious, and individuals who are humbled by the opportunity to share their personal stories and to listen to the stories of others. At their core, they are living and learning through a commitment to love people with music, words, and actions. The Peace Poets wrote the song, I Can't Breathe, about the death of Eric Garner. The actor, Samuel L. Jackson, heard the song, invited via YouTube celebrities and others to record their own versions of it, and it went viral, becoming an anthem of the movement for black lives, widely sung in demonstrations. The Peace Poets have similarly worked with immigration rights, indigenous and environmental justice groups to develop music as part of their political practice. The Peace Poets want to reach the people in the hood and the people in the movement. They want to reach young people who listen to hip hop. They want to reach organizers who are dedicating their lives for the fight for human rights, just housing, immigration reform, police accountability, and so on. They want to reach students like you, of all races and of all genders and all class backgrounds, to those who have an open mind. And they want to open all of our minds and eyes and the mind's eyes to really recognize our state of oppression and our path towards liberation. Give it up for the peace poets. Peace, family. Peace, peace, peace. Yes. Make some noise oh, if you boy. believe that all life is sacred. <laughs> it is beautiful to be able to say that and have One, folks two. who have been reflecting and have been walking this path respond and to be able to have this exchange with y'all. We will be sharing some poems, we will be sharing some songs, and we hope that this is a beginning of a conversation with y'all. And we would also like to invite y'all to use your voice during this time, to use your movement during this time. We like to see this as a collaboration. And so if you feel something, we would like to invite you into our practices. You may have heard us snapping on the side as folks are speaking, uh, because it's a practice of affirmation to say I see you and I hear you. Uh, so let's, let's just warm up our fingers real quick and have a little snapping going on. And welcome y'all to that poetic tradition, yeah. And sometimes the poem ends, right? And we just wanna be like, yo, I really want you to know that what you said Move me. And we got to clap. And so sometimes we clap. So let's hear a, a round of applause real quick for each other for showing up. Yes. And to invite y'all even beyond this time, if somebody says something that moved you, uh, to follow up with them afterwards and just to let them know that their words impacted you. Because we all need to be fed. And this is not where our work ends. This is where it begins. So this first song I would like to invite you in. I see a lot of family who have stood and sang with us mm -hmm. at the Eloy Detention Center in Arizona and also at the border. 
And we would like to bring in that community, the SOA Watch and the Encuentro community, who are joining their voices and their movement with people who are directly impacted, people who have lost loved ones, people who still have family members and have yet to know if they're safe, if they're taken care of. We would like to ground this moment and this song in that relationship. And this is a song we've sung for the last two years as folks who were in the detention center were putting their blankets to their windows because this was in the evening to let us know that they were hearing our words. Though they couldn't sing with us, though they couldn't stand with us, they were still with us. Mm -hmm. And so I would like y'all to repeat after me, and this is going to be some Spanglish, so I would, I would like y'all to flex your linguistic skills as well. So the first line is, Oye mi gente, Oye mi gente, traemos la fuerza, traemos la fuerza. That's saying, hey yo my people, we bring the strength, right? That's right. La libertad, la libertad, es mi única bandera, es mi única bandera. Liberation for all is my only flag. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles. Right, and that's speaking to indigenous history. Whereas in Standing Rock, we saw indigenous family connecting from all over Turtle Island, Central and South America, the eagle and the condor. And that is going to be the foundation of so much of our movement that's going to heal our country that's going to heal our world. It's tapping into that indigenous wisdom, right? And the last line, no human being will ever be illegal. No, no human, human being will ever, ever be, be illegal. illegal. Right, y'all got it. Now let's sing it again, grounding ourselves in the fact that this song has been sung in the streets and will continue to be sang in the streets as long as we have air in our lungs, That's as right. long as our feet can carry us, as long as there is work to do. Oye mi gente, traemos la fuerza, la libertad es mi única bandera. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles. No human being will ever be illegal. Oye. Oye mi gente, traemos la fuerza, la libertad es mi única bandera. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles. No human being will ever be illegal. Yo. Hay una sola raza, familia humana. La Pachamama canta, yo escucho sus palabras. Ella dice, basta, no va la matanza. Cálmense mis hijos, piensen en mañana. La esperanza vive en los ojos de chiquitos. Todo el mundo es posible, ya está escrito. Like the San Patricios, fighting for the Mexicans. What the flag, freedom what I represent. Que el pueblo se levante. Levante. Para todos en este instante. Bobo o ciego, veo el elefante. Por eso, pa'lante. Siempre pa'lante. Forward with no fear of a border. We know Racism is a disorder, say master upon the quarter, leading us to the slaughter, but calling someone illegal is stupid as on water. Say, oye mi gente, traemos la fuerza, la libertad es mi única bandera. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles, no human being will ever be illegal. We say no. Right. No ban and no wall. We say no. Come on. No ban and no wall. No ban and no wall. Three times. No, no, no. No ban and no wall. We say no, no, no. No ban and no wall. We say oye mi gente, traemos la fuerza. La libertad es mi única bandera. Rise up my people, my condors, my eagles. 
no human being will ever be oh, illegal. Rise up, rise up, my, my people, my condors, my eagles. No, no human being will ever be illegal. That's so. So family, this, this poem that um, I'm going to share first is called Lucero. And in New York, yeah, <laughs> you're, <laughs> in New York, where we are very proud to be from. And also recognizing that home is also where we need to do the work. Uh, we have a misperception or misconception of New York as being completely progressive and have, having shared humanitarian values which if you live in New York, you know that is not true. And so this, this poem is also in memory of someone who was killed for being who they were, for having brown skin, for looking how they looked. And this was a person who was working hard for their family, who was coming home from work who had dreams for their children and for their brothers. And that was extinguished through violence and hatred. And so I'd like to dedicate this poem to all immigrants and to all people who have had to leave home in order for a better life. This is for the immigrant, undocumented and unrepentant, who says they ain't seeing me because my revolution is being me. They are the anti-celebrity, a hero whose power is invisibility. They are the underdogs, underdog, dog, try working a nine to nine with no paid overtime and a bad spine. They'll redefine your definition of on the grind. They got family on the mind. What they know about depression and dismay. We've crossed rivers to get here and cried them to stay. Undocumented. But they call us illegal. Because last time I looked, it was a crime to be equal. They are neglect personified, an existence vilified, so forget stages, pens, and pages. They are soldiers waging war below minimum wages. And sage burns slow por la gente que falta, because we remember the deception of Altahualpa. Was it worth the spoils? Their ancestors fought for gold. Their descendants fight for oil. Our blood fertilizes the soil. We resurrect in the Amazon as trees that will bring down Babylon. Though that day seems far from illegal stops asking us for green cards. But my brothers taught me a different set of colors. White man stole red man's land while using yellow man to build his railroad tram and using black hands to sow and reap the profits. So when it's said illegals don't pay taxes, I say my people have done enough to fill your pockets.
See, that day seems far from those illegal stops asking us for green cards. And my brothers did taught me a set of colors. So when they set up a mortgage that I cannot afford, and I look at history and realize, ain't none of this yours. Immigration has a history of how people end up here. I'm from the Caribbean, at least that's in this hemisphere. But they look at me with a foreign fear and distaste because I'm a mischief of mixed race. And they rather I be the illegal immigrant than a Palestinian immigrant. Because the day of all our people's revolution is imminent. And on that day, we will not ask you to let us in because God already made us citizens. So peace family. So we're coming from uh, the Bronx. Uh, hey, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what's up. And it's such, a, such an honor to be here with you all. I uh, just want to say, take a moment and say thank you for all of the affirmation um, that you've shared with us as we're just walking through the, through the halls. Um, that really refills the well from which we flow. So thank you for that. I want to do a piece for y'all that is rooted in those moments that we might not feel like we're enough, um, when we might believe this, the narrative, the stories that change up the ideas of what we find valuable in this life, away from family, away from community, and into commodity or privilege. And I want to dedicate this piece to anybody right now who, like myself, is dealing with uh, depression or mental health issues where you might wake up and not want to keep going. But perhaps you have that, that friend, that BFF, who reminds you. That this life is worth living. And it's amazing that we could be that for each other. That's power, my people. That's medicine. I grew up with these guys. Known them since uh, one of the peace poets I know since I was three years old. That's when we formed the group. Uh, <laughs> but since grade school and high school, we all grew up with each other. And um, these had been my, my teachers, my students. Um, and it's, it's been a beautiful development of our brotherhood and family that we get to do it through the spoken word as well. So check it out. <clears throat> I like to think that everything is possible, that nothing is an obstacle, that everything is optical and optimism is optimal, because pessimism never lets you listen to the God in you. Possibility is so strange and seems so odd to you when the market had done got to you. Selling all their visions on the television, opting you to listen to your insecurities while their modules placing all that sickness and disease up inside of you. But it's never to provide for you. It's always just a bottle you consuming all the products. Who really gets the benefit? Who really gets the sense of it? Let's really get a sense of it and fill it in your body, son. You are full of love and light. Spit that truth in body, son. Because cynicism consuming all of the human in them. We stay a prison reflecting all of the lumens in them. Aimed at a system that has us down on our luck. But we're in love with our people. And that's word to this luminous flux. This ain't a mic. This the way you amplify light. So we can see our own reflections in the words that you write. And this ain't a pen. This the way you channel your zen. And meditate upon the days that you were blessed to have been. And this ain't a rap. It's a prayer call to the fact that we're bigger than our fears and their societal traps. On top of that, the world is waiting for you in this hour 
to realize what you are worth and quickly step into your power. It's not just about your past. We need you more than ever to forgive all of the parts of you you thought were broke and weathered, to give some of that heart that you might think just won't belong because you're too focused on your flaws and everything that you've done wrong. But we need your song. Just look around into the sea of people. It's a celebration. Bunch of spirits bathed in starlight on a quest for liberation. And sisters and your sister, see them in your brother's eyes. New dawn and day upon us and all we have to do is rise. And the divine gave you this breath to speak and call your truth to power. In the face of all injustice and a darkness that devours. In the face of crooked cops and a violence that's systemic. It's our fate to sing our song upon this silence epidemic. And you ain't alone. Let's take the sign to welcome you home to a movement born of movements within the dance of our own. Be buoyant through revolution, be girding through liberation, up rocking to the solution, pop locking through occupation. Family, have you ever had a dream before? Then don't mistake it for impossible just because it's something you ain't seen before. Peace. I'm feeling so much love for you all right now. <laughs> Thank you all for receiving us in such a good way. Um, I want to actually uh, give gratitude right now for the relationships that exist in this room. Um, when I was uh, when I was younger, I had a uh, someone be a kind of like a big big brother figure to me and a guide in many ways um and i think he's here so i just want to shout out nick napolitano uh for his good work and appreciate gratitude <laughs> <clears throat> and um and i i like frankie said like these brothers are, are my teachers and i have another really special uh, teacher and loved one in this room who I never get to see, so I want to give a shout out to Christina Dominguez. Thank you for being the best. I always appreciate you. Yeah. <clears throat> and I really wanted to take the time to do that um, so that actually to invite us to uh, think about the person who's in this room right now with us, uh, who teaches us, who loves us, who gives us the strength that Frankie is talking about, that keeps us moving forward, that keeps us hanging in there. Um, and so I want us to think of that person. You can look at that person or not. That's all good. But I actually want us to all say together, I see you. I, see you. I appreciate you. I, appreciate you. I, love you. I love you. Thank you so much. Don't be, uh, you know, uh, be generous with those words. Uh, let each other know. Um, this poem is called All For You. And it's a, it's a poem I wrote for the young people that I would work with who were locked up. Um, and... Uh, today I want to dedicate it to one of the young men who, uh, whose name is Edwin, and he got, uh, he got sent from, from the South Bronx to upstate, and so he's still in jail right now. And right now I know a lot of our family members and friends and loved ones are locked up. Uh, and every time we gather as a community, we don't really gather uh, with all of us because of state violence, uh, because of white supremacy and, and, and imperialism and the way it lives in our lives and patriarchy and those things um you know we overcome with love and the powerful message that we get from each other so this poem is called all for you and uh yeah it's for for everyone and for for y'all here you go this is all for you 
When you locked up and hidden, I'ma call for you. I'ma smuggle in love through these walls for you. You overwhelmed because these prisons too small for you. And there's a world outside and it's all for you. I know. Most days all we want to do is bomb my dude, but this hood's full of crack and we falling through. See, we could die, my dude, or we could rise, my dude. It's up to you, but we got to be deciding soon. And I need you to know I see divine in you. I see God in you. I see a kid who's about to beat the eyes in you, and it's time. It's time to pull up like sit-ups and finish your bit up. You've been a beginner, but it's time to be bigger. Your mind getting fitter. You faster than Twitter. Imagine a world where you were the winner, where you were the writer, where you were the fighter. Imagine New York without no one at Rikers. Imagine we righteous right here and right now. There is a world out there that's staring you down, and it's all for you. Good food, good love, and it's all for you. Good nights in the club, and it's all for you. That sun in the sky, that love in her eyes, this flow, this rhyme, and it's all for you. It is all for you. There is a world out there, and it's all for you. There's an old dude singing old tunes on the corner where his whole crew want to show you what life was like when he was so cool. <laughs> and you'd be surprised, his big broke of flow too. He'd tell you stories about the way it was and it turns out he knows half your cousins. And every time you hear his mouth running, you just know this life is worth something. And he out there, he up one of them blocks, right by the woman with the beautiful locks and the beautiful skin. And she got a pool she loved to swim in. She can breaststroke or she can backstroke or she can freestyle. And that's facts, though, because there's whole oceans out there. There's emotions bigger than scared. There's long rivers and small islands and good people who love smiling. I know you, bro. You love wilding. Don't let them steal your free. Don't let them steal your free. Don't be silent. Your free mind is the real ride because they can't buy it and they can't set it. So when you spit, you rebel and I'm telling you to survive. What I'm telling you is survive. That real you that can heal you that you keep buried inside. And that right there, that's real work. When you real mad, when you real hurt, you want to burn this shit down and fight back. Love your brother because he's black. <laughs> or he's brown. Or he's white. But well, he by your side and he down to fight for your human rights. Son, I'm here to ask you to fight. No closed fist and no dumb ish. No, I'm here to ask you to write. And I know I don't know your plight, but I know your soul's full of light. So write, brother, just write, brother, and we gonna be all right. Because there's rooftops and there's sunsets. There's smart people and dumb sex. There's some regrets that are just worth it. There's real sweat from real working. There's satisfaction, there's love and action. There's hands to heal all the hurting. There's late nights full of laughter and there's daydreaming about it after. There's books of words you ain't never heard but you can still learn how to use them. Cause there's languages full of fusion. There's clarity and confusion. There's soft skin and there's hot sand. And there's a chance to heal upon this land. There is good music and traffic. There's heartbreak and there's havoc. There's some love that's so good that you'll start believing in magic. <clears throat> and it's tragic when you can't have it. And I get you getting mad at it. But the good news is that y'all cool because real soon that's all you. Only you can write your song. So write that down strong. You know Destiny, she just called for you. She said there's a world out there and it's all for you. Thank you. Yes. So I want to give y'all an option real quick because I definitely got caught up emotionally in my last piece. Um, and I wanted to ask y'all whether you would like me to share with you this next piece 
uh, which you haven't heard, called Power Concedes, uh, or if you would like me to um, have an opportunity to finish the first piece I shared uh, after having uh, a little bit of time to process it emotionally. So if, if you... <laughs> All right. Let's do it. I'll start with the, with the, with the one I was going to do this round. Um, and it's inspired by the words of Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Make some noise for the ancestors. Exactly. Whew. He has one of the most poignant lines uh, in regards to liberation, which is power concedes nothing without demand. And so I wrote this piece uh, as the uprising in Ferguson was happening. <clears throat> and I would like to dedicate this piece also to all the organizers um, on the ground level making things happen, uh, getting the rest of us in the streets with art, with song, with resources, this piece is for you. <clears throat> Power concedes nothing without demand. That means you're gonna get your freedom from your very own hands. Because the man at the top is death to your plight. He's got nightmares of when the people unite. Labor, it's not just a name to me. It's why Americans invested in slavery. These capers led to hundreds of years of free labor that we paid for while they were stacking that free paper. Freedom through blood, bone, sweat, and soot. Because when you sow all season, you want a piece of that fruit. Truth. This is my way to honor it. Freedom happens because of liberation movements not a serendipitous change of consciousness. And what is freedom if not the right to work? Our right to work the angles and right what hurts. Power concedes nothing without force of will. Don't believe me, ask the workers who were coerced and killed. At Haymarket Square, workers were hurt at will, all for a few more freedoms to work a drill. Such a novel idea to work than chill. The bourgeoisie are afraid of what time reveals. The truth is they don't own anything. They steal. Because when workers spend their life constructing, who owns the steel? Traded in their lives for a few measly meals, while they intimidate unions for a few measly deals, we must see the forces. That's why they keep blinders on horses. Power concedes nothing if you ask it a favor. Not even babies are safe. It took a movement to regulate child labor. Still becoming the country that we're yearning to be, just in 93 got unpaid maternity leave. Everything has a history. 40-hour work week, vacation, sick days. You're taking off work? That's why they enslaved. And I still see the current schism, because slavery still exists. It exists in prison. If freedom isn't tied to the way we make a living, we construct our own hell in which we live in. Power concedes nothing if you want its pity. When was the last time we ate out in the city? Who do they keep exploited in the back of the kitchen? Those who they pay below minimum wage for a living. America's dirty secret. We hate immigrants, but love their cheap labor.
but love their cheap labor. Our economic policies force them out their countries, but we ask them for green papers. <laughs> Our fear is that the next stop is transforming the world into a global sweatshop. Power concedes nothing without demand. And if you don't keep your rights by your fist, they just might fall out your hands. Thank you. All right, family, we got a special treat for everybody out here who is doing some, so much amazing work as an individual, as an organizer. Uh, one of the most precious things we can always do is teach that important skill. Uh, and there's a, a couple young people I want to bring up to the stage right now. So give it up for Karina and Miko real quick. If y'all could come on up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, y'all. So... Uh, you're about to learn a song, and that song we're going to bring to action tomorrow on the street. So uh, this is not time to be shy. This is time to not worry about how you sound. It's time to sing it like you mean it. So give it up one time for these two amazing young sisters who are about to teach you a great song. This is an original song they wrote that they're about to bless y'all with so we can use it in action tomorrow morning. I said, make some noise, y'all. Okay, hi, everybody. My name is Mika. Um, so just a little background behind this song. Um, we're from Seattle University, and... Um, yeah. A question that was asked to us was what drives us to be here, and an image that came to our mind was a light. Um, so you'll hear in the first line of the song that we call in this image of walking into the light. Um, and amidst like all the darkness in the world, you know, we were called to be that light for others. So um, the first line, it, um, I'll read them and then have you guys repeat them back to me. So come into the light. Come into the light. Together we will fight. Together we will fight. For justice and for love. For justice and for love. Rising with the sun. Rising with the sun. Nice. Okay. So um, Karina and I here are going to sing it first and then. Yes. Um, Karina and I are going to sing and then sing it once and then we'll have you all join us after. So it goes a little something like this. Come into the light. Together we will fight for justice and for love, rising with the sun. Come into the light. Together we will fight. Together we will fight for justice and for, for love. Justice and for love, rising with the sun. Rising with the sun. We come into the light. Together we will fight. For justice and for love, rising with the sun. Come into the light. Come into the light. Together we will Together fight. Together we will fight. For justice for and for love. Justice and for love, rising with the sun. Rising with the sun. A little louder. Come, Come into the, the light. Together we will fight. For justice and for love. Rising with the sun. Come to where? Come into the light. Hey. What? Together yeah, we will fight. For what? For justice and for love. How are we going to do it? Rising with the sun. We come into the light. Together we will fight. For justice and for love. Rising with the Let's do it two more times. Come into the light. Sing it loud. Together we will fight. Let me hear y'all. For justice, justice and for love. Let's so Rising right. with the sun. Do it one more time. Come into the light. Let's go. Together we will fight. For justice and for love. Rising with the sun. Thank you. Give it up for Mika and Karina.
right. That's what I'm talking about. Y'all down to sing that tomorrow in the streets or what? Make some noise, y'all. <clears throat> I just want us to really quickly just internalize it. Those amazing young leaders just composed that song, practiced leading it, made a melody, practiced leading it, and just had 2,000 people singing it. And that's what we are capable of. So make some noise for them and for yourselves. We were asked a great question earlier today. It was, what, are the, what do you hope that all the people who came out here know when we leave? Uh, and that some of what we talked about was we hope that you are so deeply rooted that we need, we need your courage and your creativity that y'all need each other's courage and creativity that all the future generations desperately need your courage and your creativity. The land and the water needs your courage and your creativity. And so if you're ready to accept that responsibility, if you're ready to tap into the endless power that is within all of creation, that is gifted to us by our ancestors who came before us. If you're ready to honor that, then I'm gonna invite y'all to sing with us. And if you're comfortable and able to do so, we invite you to stand with us. We have one more song. Yes. <clears throat> so we definitely wanna invite y'all to sing with us. And again, feel free. If you got some harmony up in there if you, that you wanna throw in, go ahead. So, and if you want to move your body with this, feel free as well. So if you could repeat after me, it goes like this. I have not come here alone. I have not come here alone. I carry my people in my bones. I carry my people in my bones. I have not come here alone. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. All right, this is going to be beautiful, y'all. <laughs> All right. I have not come here alone. Uh, I carry my people in my bones. That's right. Uh, I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Say, I have not. I have not. Come here alone. Come here alone. Say, I carry my people. I carry my people in my bones. Sing it like you mean it. I yes. have not. I have not. I have not. Come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Uh, right. I'm not alone like our people at a graduation. They call your name, you hear the call, oh, it's, it's a, a celebration. celebration. Rooted in culture, traditions of libation. Stolen black gold, spread through many nations. So many iterations, we are the variations. But at large, we don't understand the situation. Love is simple, but we're caught, caught up, up in, in the, the complication. I am not alone, I feel myself in your vibration. Showing up loud with my grandmother's voice. Uh -huh. Coming through calm with my old man's voice. In case you're wondering who making all the noise, who? I'm coming with the hood. Who taught me King Soy? I'm, I'm from a long line of activistas, breaking down the borders of imperialistas. We don't die, we multiply. We a million more times than meets the eye. I have not Sing that. come here alone. Say no, 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 people. no. Carry my people in my bones. Come Sing, on. I have, uh. not. I have not come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Check it out. Uh, I sit back and reflect on Jacob Vada, Vada, Malcolm Martin, and Frederick D. Huey, Huey P. and Asada. Nelson, Jesus, Muhammad, Ghani, and the Soldier, Soldier and Truth. Truth. All the mamas and the papas out here. Steady raising our youth. youth. Playing seeds because you know of our roots. With our hands in the land till we bearing, bearing this fruit. fruit. At the bay calling out, telling us we arrived. Look deep in your eyes and realize I, I have, have not come, come on, come here alone. alone. No, 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 no. Carry my people. In my bones, That's say right. I have not, I, I have, not, have not come here alone. 
And if you listen, you can hear them. In my Let's do that again. Come on. I have not. I have not. Let me hear y'all. Come here alone. You can sing it louder than that. I can't. I can't. my people. What? In my. my sing that for your ancestors. I have not. Come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in We're going to drop the clap one more time saying, I have not. Come here alone. Sing it to each other. I, I carry my, my people in my bones. Sing, I have not. I have not. I have not. Come here alone. And if you listen, you can hear them in my Sing soul. that last line. If you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Sing it one more time. If you listen, you can hear them in my soul. Thank you. Family, we are the Peace Boys. It's been an honor to rock for you, to connect to you. We love y'all so much. We got some poetry books and some music at the registration table. Um, please, if you want to take a piece of our art and our, our hearts home, which you do that, uh, and connect to us. Palante, siempre palante. Gracias. All right, thank you to the Peace Poets for their beautiful, unifying voice. As we move forward tomorrow, we hope to channel all of this spirit, all of this energy into the unified voice that we bring to the hill. Our time together teaches us our time together here at the teaching gives us the space to contemplate, learn, think, and discuss as an Ignatian family. We heard about the need for comprehensive and just immigration reform, reform that supports the most vulnerable migrants and refugees. Now we will hear about the need for comprehensive criminal justice reform. I'm happy to introduce to you Jane Adams, the Senior Policy Analyst at Bread for the World. Y'all thought y'all were getting out of here, didn't you? Surprise! <laughs> You're still here. Now let me rap for you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, hi, my name is Jane Adams, and I'm a Policy Analyst at Bread for the World. Um, I work on federal criminal justice policy, and I'm really happy to be here today and share with you my insights on racism, criminal justice reform, and what we're collectively called to do as advocates. I think there's maybe one up here. Um, so one thing I want to share with you, and one thing that you should know about me, is that I am Southern. I am very, very Southern. Uh, you might not be able to tell because I definitely don't have an accent, but I'm about as southern as it gets. I'm a ninth generation Alabamian. Nine. Yeah, Alabama, some Alabama in the front. It's about to get real bad for us. Um, but uh, essentially, my family has lived in Alabama since the 1800s. On my family tree, you'll find names like Maud and Trifosa and Letitia. And yes, maybe there were the occasional relatives who married other relatives. It's Alabama, you know? Um, sorry, it's just a fact. Um, can't help who my family is. Um, but I want to talk to you about the most amazing woman in my life who had the most amazing Southern accent. It was so Southern, it almost sounded British. I can't really explain it, so I'll just play it for you. So this is a recording of my grandmother talking about what it was like for her to move to New York to serve in the Navy during World War II. Let's see. 
Oh, no. There we go. Play. Oh, goodness. Okay, I was worried this would happen. Let me interpret her. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, my grandmother has an incredibly southern accent. Um, very, very thick, very, very southern. Um, and I loved my grandmother. She was a really special person to me. Uh, she always told the best stories and was there for me when I needed her the most. When I got bullied at school, and that happened quite a bit, my grandmother would say things to me like, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will always hurt you. I'd always heard that adage before, but not in the way that she said it. My grandma believed in kindness, and she rightly knew that what we say to one another can hurt or heal. And yet, if I were to Google my grandmother's name right now, this very moment, the first thing that would come up would be this. This is an article quoting my grandmother celebrating Confederate Flag Day. And if I kept speaking, I would find articles about my grandmother's engagement in the United Daughters of the Confederacy and how she donated money to erect these Confederate monuments. And if I kept digging through my family tree, I'd find stories about my family supporting segregation, participating in lynchings, I'm sorry, supporting the laws that led to mass separation, fighting for the Confederacy, and then I'd eventually get to the evidence of how my family owned hundreds of slaves. How is it the same charming woman, my grandmother, who taught me kindness, participated in and perpetuated racism and racist institutions? What do I do with this legacy I inherited? My heritage is rife with racism, and I am complicit in it. I've been in a black neighborhood and locked the car doors, thinking that I would be at more risk there than I would be in my own neighborhood. My people, my kin, myself, I perpetuated and participated in racist systems of oppression. That's a reality I cannot escape. Each day I try to reconcile and repent with it. I try to do the work to confront my past by changing my present oppression. And I change the present through a commitment to justice and advocacy. It is not enough to just struggle with the past of my family. I must confront the present realities of racism and how they are harming millions of families. This is how I pay reparations, with my time, my money, and my advocacy. Tomorrow, Tomorrow, many of you will go to the halls of Congress and advocate to your elected officials for the need for criminal justice reform. And in my opinion of working on criminal justice advocacy for the past two or so years, I can tell you that America's criminal justice system is our most obvious example of racism and the racism that infiltrates this society. Our criminal justice system is broken. The inequities in the system are stark and they are alarming. I have, I'm quite certain that most of you have heard that the United States is only 5% of the world's population, but has 25% of the world's inmates. In fact, rates of incarceration have soared since the early 1980s, even though crime has not. And the reason rates of incarceration have soared is because of mandatory minimum sentences, especially drug crime mandatory minimums. Various Catholic leaders, like the bishops and the Society of Jesuits, have described mandatory minimum sentences as inherently flawed because they limit a judge's ability to look at the individual person in his or her circumstances when deciding a sentence. They are a rubber stamp for racist injustice. And in America, justice is not blind. It isn't. If you've heard that, it's wrong. It's very aware of a person's race. Our justice system disproportionately locks up black and brown people. And in fact, when a defendant is African American, studies have shown that prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue charges to carry mandatory minimum sentences. Was any, raise your hand if anyone in here was born in 2001. Anybody? My goodness. 
I know it's stunning. I just, all the old people are cringing. Um, okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. Put your hands down. Actually, no, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. 2001. Look around you. In 2001, black men born in 2001 have a one in three likelihood of going to jail at some point in their life. One in three. Compare that to the rates of whites, you can see it up there. And you can see that the system is broken and it favors white people like me. The effects of mass incarceration are far reaching and the system as is poses significant barriers to ending hunger and poverty. When parents are taken out of their homes due to harsh sentencing guidelines, the children suffer. And according to one study, Almost 70% of households reported having difficulty meeting basic needs like food and housing after a family member was incarcerated. America has an addiction to locking people behind bars, and it is long past time to fix this problem. Tomorrow, many of you will have the opportunity to speak truth to power when you advocate to your members of Congress. And I want you to know that to advocate, to speak truth to government, is a Catholic social teaching principle that goes all the way back to St. Paul using his Roman citizenship to advocate on behalf of the prisoners he was jailed with. This is the right to participate. To speak truth to government officials is sacred, and it is foundational in being a member of the church. If you aren't doing it, you aren't being a Christian. It's just the truth. Now, I'd like for you to raise your hand if you're participating in the advocacy day tomorrow. Go on. Woo, good Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If your hand is raised, I want to thank you. And I also just want to be brutally honest with you. Your commitment could change the course of the nation's history. I cannot express how pivotal this moment is for criminal justice reform. Right now, Congress is making big decisions about the future of our justice system. Somewhere a few miles away, the people in power, the people who are supposed to represent your interests, are determining whether we reverse course in our addiction to prison or whether we press on with the oppression of the poor and vulnerable. This May, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a prison reform bill that was a good first step, but not nearly enough to overhaul the system. The good news is that the Senate wants to do even more than prison reform. Republicans and Democrats in this divided democracy have found commonality by working together to enact reforms to our criminal justice system, and they want to enact mandatory minimum sentencing reforms, which, by the way, have ballooned mass incarceration and the federal budget. In fact, in September, President Trump expressed a willingness to consider adding even more criminal justice reforms uh, to the prison reform bill that passed the House. But he said he wouldn't consider that kind of bill until after the election. Well, guess what Tuesday is? It's the election, that's right. Which means that when Congress gets back in just a week or so, they're gonna be thinking about issues like criminal justice reform. Now has never, it's the most important time. Last year we worked on criminal justice reform and somebody got up here and they said, this is the time. But I can't, I mean, the articles are there. They're thinking about it, they're debating about it, and they wanna pass it. This, but in order for Congress to take time, consider debate, and vote on comprehensive policies, they need to know that this issue matters to their constituents, which would be you, and I cannot express how important it is. We might be on the cusp of seeing sweeping changes that unlocks the prison doors for thousands that have been put there because of unfair sentencing policies. Now, my good friend, Mr. Quincy, said that solving mass incarceration is not basically an economic or political problem, it's an ethical problem. Ignoring those who are incarcerated, leaving their families behind, allowing the criminal justice system to lock away decades of black and brown families is an ethical problem. We will never end mass incarceration if we do not step up and show the people in power that we care about the human beings that are locked behind bars and that their sentence and their incarceration does not define them as a person. 
Catholic social teaching states that everyone has God-given dignity and deserves to be treated with respect. And I gotta tell you, mandatory minimum sentencing has violated that teaching by deepening racial inequality and exacerbating structural poverty for many, especially people of color. It is a legacy that is just as racist as the racism that my family inhabited. Any reform to our nation's criminal justice system must start with the restoration of dignity for those involved. Pope Francis, he called on us to bring good news to people who are incarcerated and to encounter each other. And I just gotta say, I think the best good news we can bring is to see comprehensive criminal justice reform passed out of Congress and signed into law by the president. So tomorrow, when you meet with members of Congress and their staff, Make sure to do the following things. Share your story. Do you have a story like mine? Probably not, nine generations of Alabama, but you probably have struggled with racism and you've probably done racist things. And you now know how the criminal justice system perpetuates racism. But maybe your story isn't like mine. Maybe you're a person of color and have experienced racism. If you feel called, share. Number two, always ask for what you want, not what you think you can get. It's not your job to negotiate a criminal justice deal. It's your job to ask for what you want to see changed. Congress isn't gonna give you everything you want, but it's important for them to know what you want. Number three, remind them of your faith. It's okay to talk about Jesus, and it's okay to talk about Catholic social teaching, and it's okay to talk about the Pope in your meetings. I always encourage people who are talking to their elected officials to find a biblical story or a quote by a faith leader that inspires them and then share it. And number four, remind them that you care and that you vote. Believe it or not, most members of Congress want to know what voters in their state or district care about. The fact that you care about ending mass incarceration will mean a lot to many offices. Now, I'd be a really bad lobbyist if I didn't share what you should say when you're in these offices. So here are some quick things to remember. Make sure to ask the staff person if your member of Congress will support and vote for legislation that enacts criminal justice reform. Make sure to make the ask. If you don't make the ask, you've left the meeting without them knowing what to do next. Number two, make sure to ask the staff person if the member of Congress will call on their own party leadership, Republican or Democrat, to make criminal justice reform a priority, not only in this Congress, but in the next one. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but party leadership decides what bills go on the floor. You could tell your member of Congress all day you care about criminal justice reform, but until their leadership cares about criminal justice reform, it'll never see the light of the halls of Congress. So I've Really enjoyed my time with you. I'm really bummed you didn't get to hear my grandma's fantastic southern accent. Try it again. I'm not, you can come see me, and I will play it for you. It's fantastic. Um, but I'm honored to be here. Bread for the World, the organization I work for. Who's, who's heard about Bread for the World before? Yeah? Woo, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Bread for the World, the organization I work for, would be pleased to have you visit our booth where we have resources about mass incarceration available, or you could simply text BREAD to 738674, it's on the bottom of the screen, to learn more. And I'll be at the booth after this to answer your questions and to speak with you. Thank you so much. Now for everyone's favorite time, it is time for announcements. Um, any breakout presenters, please make sure to stop by the registration desk. The ISN has a special gift for you.